This is part two of our symposium with Kingsley Dennis. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. We are so glad you could join us, friends. Today, Kingsley Dennis is joining us again for our second symposia, and we want to continue consciously exploring with him. Welcome, Kingsley. So glad to have you back with us. Thank you, Susan, and everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, to be back and speaking with you. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to speaking with Kingsley about his latest book, Dawn of the Akashic Age. And in your book, which uh, was co-authored by Irvin Laszlo, you speak of global awakening, which will increase the sense and inner desire to develop humanitarian, ecological, and equitable systems. Would you uh, describe for us, Kingsley, what you call the Akashic Age and tell us more about your book? Yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, the, the term Akashic is not a new term and perhaps many people will be familiar with in terms of um, the Akashic records and, and this type of context. The term Akashic actually is an old um, Vedic word that the Indian rishis used and they refer to it as being um, the fifth element in that uh, our manifest reality has the four elements of uh, water, air, earth and fire. Yet underlining this, the, the, uh, the, the collective fundamental field which binds everything is the Akasha. So that term everybody and myself took to um, refer to um, the coming era or, or later later age, age later times in our social cultural development of the Akashic age because it refers to this underlying field of connectivity. So as we've already discussed the, in quantum physics, the notion of non-locality um, ref- also validates this underlying field. But also um, how will the question is how will social systems uh, reflect also this <clears throat> underlying uh, connectivity and field? Mm. And part of that is what we've discussed in moving from vertical systems to horizontal systems, which maybe I feel we've touched on briefly before. And that is um, going from the authoritarian top-down hierarchical systems, which also include this um, obedience to authority we talked about, and going and um, shifting, transitioning to a horizontal model, which whereby reflects a connectivity, an intercommunication between people and themselves across the planet in a very physical sense, between networks, uh, global networks of communication, through communities, through really, um, as you might say, um, cutting out the middleman. Um, mm-hmm. you know, so we don't need a broker to broker our relations. And, and this is reflected in a lot of services that are now cropping up. You know, we can we can go direct to the producer of something and and acquire it. And this is why it's giving rise to the cottage industries are, are coming back. Um, we are globally connected through um, the rise of non-government organisations, community groups, networks, now grassroots organisations. The uh, the commentator Paul Hawking called this referred to it as blessed unrest and the fact that he said it's the the biggest revolution in history which is not talked about in, in the in the world there are there are tens of thousands um, apparently there are millions of, of organizations listed as chari- non-governmental organizations or charities that are doing work on the ground networking people so this um, we feel is a major feature of the akashic age is that people are starting to connect up 
and get active and to do things for themselves and not wait for government body to set up an official organization or do this. People are making change happen. Um, they're starting their, for example, they're starting their own food groups and, and, and healthy living, sustainability groups, uh, energy groups, even setting up campaigns. Um, we see it, I think we, we've seen many instances of people creating their, their peaceful resistances through networks. So this horizontal, it's almost like a, a tapestry is being uh, woven. So people talk in terms of the grid and the grid lines. For me, that's a, it's the same analogy, but slightly older language. I prefer to use the analogy of tapestry and weaving. It seems organic, and also weaving a tapestry doesn't have holes in between like a grid does. We are slowly weaving our togetherness and connectivity. And that, I feel, is not an accident. It's part of the flow, the evolutionary flow of how we're knitting ourselves together as a planet, as a people. And this is part of the awakening because people awaken when they come in contact with information, with like-minded people, with energy from, from other people. It just seems to trigger people off. So the great awakening is, is not going to come from the top down. It's going to come from within people by connecting. And on a social level, um, this transitioning society is not going to come from the center. It's going to come from the periphery, my feeling mm. is, and, and, Irv, and our feeling with Irving. So change will happen on the periphery, and it'll start to just develop like a tapestry and grow in and grow in and grow in until the center will be overwhelmed. Now, for example, in my own writings, I refer to such people as the new monastics, in that monastics are people who are, you know, beaving away, working away quietly, no, you know, not walking around with a, a neon sign or a billboard trying to announce it always. They're just doing their thing quietly and, and doing it persistently. And that's making change. And I call that silent overwhelming. Mm. And I feel that the change is going to be, you know, the, in a way, the, 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 the central power structures may not see it coming. They're going to be silently overwhelmed by a groundswell of people just connecting and doing the change for themselves. That, I feel, is a new model, and we refer to that model as um, the Akashic Age. Well, I'm seeing these everywhere. We have a local out of Glasgow internet service called Gumtree. I don't know if anybody's heard of it, but you can get anything and everything there, and you can find work there. You can buy anything there. Of course, there's eBay. Chipper often speaks of people sitting in their garage putting something together and selling it out of there. But I was also sort of chuckling to myself, thinking, well, that sort of sounds like Sky Blue Symposia. We're kind of quietly digging away and working. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you are also manifesting it by what you're doing right now and our conversation and the, the conversations you have and the people you reach. That is part of the new model. Um, mm. In fact, in fact, I'm just I'm uh, a, con a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, and I'm I'm involved with his work. He's um, set up um, a project called Energetic Exchange, mm. and he's also set up a website for this. And it's like you talked about people bartering goods, but this is not a barter system. It's just a purely exchange system. I'm not expecting anything in return. So you set up a website, and it's almost like Google. So if you have something to give, you go on the website, and you just register your gift. You put in the keywords, and you register it, and you leave it. People mm. who come into the website, if they have a need, they'll type in their need, and the website will try to automatically connect them. So it's like a Google search engine. If mm -hmm. they connect their need with your gift, they'll connect up and try to then make the exchange. Yeah. So, Is it so similar to... Uh, there's one here called, I think it's called something for free. If you've got something extra that you don't need or you want to gift away and that people that need it then hook up to that. Is it similar to that? It, it sounds like so, yeah. And so as you, this is a good example of, you know, there's not just one of these projects in the world. I've come across similar sharing sites in, in Spain and, other, and, and Germany. Mm -hmm. People now are thinking, well, you know, even the barter economy is still a slightly old paradigm in that I give something in return for something else. Therefore, I expect a transaction. 
But yeah. why don't I just give something that I don't need and maybe, you know, what what comes around goes around. When I need something, something will come to me because that's just the way energy is exchanged. Yes. Lovely. Lovely. Kind of a paying forward sideways. <laughs> mm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> without yeah, uh, without expectation of reward. Or as Charles Eisenstein calls it, the gift economy where yep. you produce what it is that you want to and uh, have the ability to, to create, and you just share it. And rightly so. And we were um, honored that Charles Einstein wrote a piece for the Kashi Age. We invited him to write a contribution about how the gift economy would fit into the, the future um, vision. And, um, and Charles wrote what a, what a wonderful article on that. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad to hear that that's in there. Um, in the book, it lays out six noxious personal beliefs and five lethal cultural beliefs. Would you list these, please, and speak briefly of them to help us identify them within ourselves, our societies, and cultures, and then speak of how they are outdated and why? Okay. I I can't lift them, list them off the top of my tongue because I haven't actually worked, I've not had a, seen the book for many months. The book went into, obviously, off to the publishers eight, ten months ago, and I haven't um, really referred to it since. Uh, as but, many as, as might come to your mind, then. You see, in, in general, the, the noxious beliefs really are a very selfish, eye-centered um, context. And what we're trying to say is that the Akashic Age is we're moving from an, an I culture to a we culture. And so the Noxic beliefs are the ones that deal with the I-ness, the, the selfishness, which we may not even recognize as being selfish because it belongs to the old paradigm of, of um, I have to make the best of this world, Darwinian survival of the fittest. So it's this sense of I consume for myself without regarding the consequences of what I consume for others. And I have to get ahead without, again, regarding um, regard for others. What's good for me is, is what is good for the world. And so it, it's, it's, again, based around consumption, resources, and the identity, I think, is a major part because how we see ourselves obviously reflects in, in how we um, consume. So the the old industrial model, which really is a paradigm that we're moving away from, was based around this, the individual, but not individuality. Because the actually the old model of the individual doesn't actually, doesn't have a sense of the great individuality because we fit into the, the consensus, um, the consensus paradigm. And so if we had a sense of the individuality, that I think would nurture the sense of what we need to do as a participatory culture. So the what we're trying to emphasize is what are the uh, reflection of moving towards a we culture, which are which is the consciousness which involves the field, the recognition of others. Is that and the principal core is the, is the golden rule. Um, do them to others as we wish them do unto us. That I, that is part of of the new um, manifesto. And at the end, later, at the latter part of the book, we did put down a manifesto of new consciousness, which is all about this collaboration, compassion, consciousness. Whereas the noxious beliefs are based around competition and conflict and conquest. So it's this: these are these noxious beliefs are about really doing it for ourselves and and taking from others. That and so all those all those terms, whether it's competition or conflict or conquest, it it really is all about not respecting or engaging in dialogue with others. Whereas if you just look at communication, consciousness, compassion, all those reflect the sense that we have to reach out. And and again, part of the the new model is the Akashic field of unity. But it, again, some people feel that, for example, in unity, the, the sense of our togetherness is primary. The sense of a, a planetary citizen is primary. And the uh, national identity comes after that. And now, 
again, some people may fear that and say, well, I know I, you know, I was born in X country and I, this is my identity. And that's part of the old model in that you know, we don't have to live by, by these given identities because that, again, puts on borders and doesn't reach out to the greater whole. And, and so we're not losing anything by, by reaching out to the, the unification of, um, of the planetary species because local place, in fact, the being in place, localization is celebrated more in the Akashic model because by being interconnected, we also then develop the resources, the contacts, the communications um, that are around us locally. We use more what is locally given rather than, rather than uh, the noxic belief of um, just invading the resources further afield. So, in fact, the Akashic model celebrates a sense of place and locale and the, the, the energy, the food, the community which are local. So there's no loss of that local identity. It's, it's, it's rather the opposite. And so that's the um, that's kind of what that's what we're putting down and moving towards. Okay, no, that makes perfect sense, and it's the type of thing that blends, as you would say, harmoniously with moving forward. It's not um, um, destructive; it's additive. It builds the local upon the more regional upon the global, and helps people in that way to uh, establish the connect connections that they're looking for. So, uh, with with this in mind, then, what older systems do you see as being revised or even revived, and what new systems do you and your co-authors envision moving forward? Well, um, really, m most of the systems we have, um, social systems and, and global systems, we the ones we, we focused on, we looked at energy of course and um, finances and education as well they they were the major ones and in in terms you see these these systems are no longer sustainable and I, I feel that's clear we've we've talked about this i think already and we've yes, inferred yes. this yeah and so you know if we if we go back uh, earlier centuries when we had um the 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 energy revolution of wood. You know, there were there were fears that you know we're going to we're going to chop down all the trees and therefore we're going to have nothing else as energy and and woe woe is us. And then what happened is that we moved to a, a coal energy revolution. And then on the cusp of that we came we discovered oil and then we 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 developed the means to create electricity. So what we find is that on on the cusp of of the of certain eras. Another energy um, pattern or an energy source comes into play. So it's, it's not part of it's a question of necessity. And also that necessity and the, there's a kind, I feel there's, a, there's an inno, innovative sense in the human that we are looking to what is going to f um, be required as well. And also solutions coming to being through, through the necessity. So we're talking now about the energy revolution of uh, fossil fuels, for example. And the old paradigm says, well, we have to tweak this as, as much as we can. Maybe you know, we create some, some biofuels um, or we create some hybrid fuels, and et cetera. But you know, I, that is trying to look at a solution through the old mind. And you can never create a true solution through the mindset which created the problem in the first place. And I'm, as, as Einstein famously said, I'm paraphrasing Einstein. So what we're sensing in that um, the first step may be to uh, moving towards um, respecting energies which are more localized, therefore um, energies which are solar in, in hot countries, uh, using tidal waves, water waves, uh, using the flow from inland rivers, using geothermal. All these can be used more or less according to the locale. And also there most likely that the first stage will be a technologies of let's say the networks of the networks feeding back systems so people can create their energy and then perhaps um, sell it back to the grid or feed it back etc but this this won't 
um, replace the fossil fuel on the largest sense because fossil fuel is not just about energy, it's about the way we live. Most of our utensils are made from plastics, which is oil. Our food are created by artificial fertilizers and then packed with plastics and then delivered. All this takes oil. Our cosmetics are oil. So really, you know, again, we need to rethink the way we do things, not just replace. And so the first stage may be technologies to best utilize energies that we have um, alternative wise. But we, we feel that there's going to come a point, a cusp, where we will also shift to something which we're not, we, we, we haven't seen yet. It's, it's almost as if it's around a blind spot. Because, you know, when, we're in the, when we were obviously, when we were in the wood revolution, no one saw coal coming. So there are lots of technologies now working with different energies, whether it's um, magnetic energies, um, certain of the vacuum energies, even working with energy from water. There, there are many organizations, there are many charitable projects working around the world looking at new energies. And these energies will be, um, I, I fear, will be fed out to people in the locale, developing countries, etc., rather than going, rather than be monopolized by these, what we have now, the large corporations. So that's that's an example of energy. And another one we focused on was education. And we looked at the, the shift in education now where there are many uh, great universities who are putting their uh, courses online. There's the Khan University giving thousands and thousands of courses for free online. There are organizations which are doing peer-to-peer connecting of students, so students learn from each other. Now, the old model when we were at school was that if we tried to talk to our neighbor and and work out on a problem, we we got our hands slapped and we got told punished for cheating, where in in fact the new model is collaboration. We don't wish to work alone. We wish to work in collaboration. So the new tools of technology are able to connect people all um, in peer-to-peer learning groups, um, and there, there are, I, I don't wish to list off any projects um, particularly to give them favor, but there are, there are certain institutions, certain universities and certain pro- um, online organizations which are developing these uh, networks of peer-to-peer, which means students learn from each other and they, they pass on their, their work to each other and they even mark each other's work. So when you're marking a fellow student's work, the results found out that in fact there were more balanced in that because they felt a responsibility and they also knew that the fellow students would be looking at their work also. So that's again taking responsibility of learning away from the the obedience of the teacher, the one one person teaching the many, to the many teaching the many, like an apprenticeship role. Um, there are some schools setting up new projects to put students of different ages and different abilities in the class together. So therefore the the older ones or the students with more knowledge can help the younger learners to learn. So they're learning amongst themselves rather than again just relying on one teacher. So it's a kind of distributed a distributed learning pattern. So that model of distribution uh, and dispersed connectivity and learning we've looked at in other areas such as finances and um, uh, careers, um, jobs and transport, uh, uh, to name a few in the book. Okay, terrific. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. It's it's a new distributed collaborative model that um, will help to solve the world's problems because it can't come from a top down because there's no one who knows enough in order to make those directions. That's That's a very nice direction to be heading in. But, of course, on our way there, there will be obstacles that would need to be overcome for this vision of the future and uh, certainly a significant amount of effort. Um, how do you see those shaping up? It's true. I mean, this is not a clear-cut process. We do say that the process will happen over time and th- um, there will be trial and errors. But And the, the energy one is, is the, the most, I think, the energy and finances are... are the most problematic because there are monopolistic factors involved. We're seeing more progress on the educational side and on the um, kind of career side. There are, um, one of the, the forces with the phenomenon we looked at was crowdsourcing. 
where people are looking to uh, for financing from each other. Crowdsourcing is where someone proposes a project and says, well, for example, I want to make a film, and if you can give uh, five euros or five dollars or five pounds to this film, uh, at the end of it, I'll, everyone who donates, I'll give you a, a DVD. And this financing from the people helps to create the film instead of going to a big producer or, or studio. And this model is, is working for many online industries where people are contacting uh, directly with, with the, the, the end user. And, um, and so, and, and as I mentioned before, there's a kind of return to cottage industries because people now can connect with people directly. So in these areas, there's more development, there's more movement because people can do it. People can get involved and start to create it themselves. But where the difficulties will be, will be in the areas which have been um, predominantly controlled from the top down for so long. Because those, um, the status quo industries which, which have their power over these will not wish to give them up lightly. So there may have to be some type of um, what we call um, critical threshold, which may, basically means a kind of crisis point for there to be perhaps some semi-collapse to enable some new models to start coming and working. Because at the moment, um, like um, in, in energy, for example, the doors are closed. Now, these projects are developing. In economics, there's many projects developing, such as um, alternative currencies, uh, like the, the, the city of Bristol in the UK has a Bristol pound. There's a Totnes pound. There's lots of local currencies now starting to develop, and many developing in Greece also because of what's happening there in their crisis. Um, but again, they're not entering the major systems yet because they're locked out. And so for a lockout to to um, to cease and the gates to open, there needs to be a, a point of criticality or crisis point. Um, there may have to be a further downward collapse in the economy for there to be serious allowances for, for the alternative to be um, developed and considered. So that will take time and perhaps will, most likely will need more disruption. But the other, the other areas where people can start to get involved and develop it now, there's a lot faster growth in those areas. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm seeing here in the United States more interest in the collaborative and community currencies and uh, as Buckminster Fuller said, you don't change the existing reality uh, by working against it, you build a better model, to paraphrase him. So uh, those types of things I think are happening and they'll each probably find their own unique way to come about because as you had also said, it, it it's not within the vest, uh, the interests of the vested interests to seek these types of changes, and so uh, they'll be organic and local in their origin. Thank you. Really appreciate your thoughts on that. Susan? Yeah, well, I was just um, going to respond to um, the last comment because I, I think book Mr. Fuller's uh, uh, quote there is, is spot on, and, and that's the, the core point, um, is that this process will happen organically by the alternative systems won't go ahead fighting uh, head-on um, that's only going to empower the incumbent systems. And also, it's no good for us if, for example, the world economy collapsed. Because people ask me this question quite often. Do you think the whole economy is going to collapse and, and when? Well, my answer is if the whole economy collapses, then there's going to be anarchy in the world. You know, and we don't want that. It's not in anyone's interest to have a total collapse um, I immediately. Because how, you know, how imagine... If the economy collapses, then uh, food systems will collapse. We, people um, will, will riot in the streets, will start to defend themselves and attack the shops and loot. This is not going to help anyone. So what, what needs to be done is that the, the alternatives need to be developed gradually and gradually and be put in place like a scaffold underneath the, the, the rotting, um, crumbling um, incumbent systems. So when they finally do break away, there's not going to be totally collapsed because the alternative systems underneath, like a scaffold, are ready to come through and take their role. And that will need to be an organic, natural way um, in to avoid unnecessary uh, chaos and, and disruption. That's a great image to use, the scaffolding. Uh, I just love it. And uh, we can really be proactive with that. Kingsley, 
there's many adults right now who are consciously evolving to meet the transitional challenge we're, we're in now. But I'm wondering if today's youth, perhaps beginning with the Pluto and Scorpio generation, which is symbolized by the Phoenix, and they were born between 1984 and 1994, might already be hardwired with a new consciousness. Will they and the generations that follow them be the ones that rise from the ashes of these old systems, be the scaffolding, so to speak, and be the radical change agents? Definitely so, I feel. And and it's quite apt that um, you've mentioned that because I've just finished writing a book which is called the phoenix generation mm. and <laughs> and i do i do look at these these generations being the system busters now i refer to the, the phoenix generation as being the children being born now but they'll be coming of, as young adults in around 2030 because the 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 young the young generation we have already their system is, is their circumstances are slightly more problematic is that they're growing up in a world which is um which is um, influx, and mm. they're in a world which is already in this tension mode. And so um, that's why we, we see some youth being very much aligned with uh, the moving forward and being hardwired, and others being caught in this age of anxiety and, and, and not sure what to do and where to go and feeling a bit um, or lost. Mm. So, so it's not so clear, but what, what I think obviously... With each generation, we're going to see much, uh, many more of the youth coming through which are aligned en masse. And I do feel they're hardwired for change um, because a lot of them, you see that they already, they get it. They, they just know that instinctively that what, it's not working, what's, what's happening now. And they just say, you know, what are you doing? You know, why are you, why are you thinking this way? It's just obvious that it's wrong. And they are getting engaged and being active. And so the change that will come, um, what I, I do feel will be generational change, is that, for example, we, what, what do we think is going to happen when in 15 years' time, or even 10 years' time, the young minds now are going to be in these positions, they'll be maybe within the finance sector, within banks, within the energy industry. You see, these old systems are maintained because the old minds, the old, the old, the old guard is still there, but you mm. see, we're having we're having a changing of the guard, and so this is important because when you have a change of guard, then they are going to be holding the fort of these great megalithic corporations and systems, etc., and they are going to be part of the vanguard of making the change, and so then we step forward maybe twenty years time. And perhaps 30 years time, we'll have a totally new generation of thinking, being born to the world, I think, I feel already thinking completely differently. When they move into positions of authority, they're going to do things differently. And that is when we're going to see real system busting coming in. Right now, it's hard work because we're trying to work with the, the material, the mindset, the people, the system we already have now. But I think it's going to get easier because we're going to have different, a different vanguard in those positions in the years to come yes and us old dinosaurs will be dying away and then that will open up space for these young ones so well <laughs> guess guess what we're gonna have to talk to you about your new book when you're ready so i'm looking forward to that <laughs> thank you susan the, the old guard the dinosaurs will some will be dying away but let's say they'll be sitting in the garden with a cup of old gray tea yeah <laughs> <laughs> sounds good and um We'd like to go on now to your uh, pro new project called Women for a Caring World. And I just think it's wonderful. And I've had a look at your website. Um, so we'll get on to that. And Chipper, you have a question? W would you please tell us about Women for a Caring World, your association, and what is their mission? Yeah, hello, Chipper. Um, thank you, and it's I'm quite privileged to be involved in this project. I was asked to to come on board as a as a in some in some way as a collaborator. I'm not sure, but I I I'm got involved, and it's a what it was is that 
a, a it's hard to say, a, let's say a, a person came forward and was willing to help um, fund to make a change in the world. And the vision was they really wanted to do something around um, the role of women, the presence of women. And so the small group convened and what they wished to do was that they felt that the future is about not only bringing women's voices to be heard and to be part of, of the processes of change, but also that we're moving towards a time where we need to harmonize the feminine, masculine energies and values. So it's not about saying, well, the future has to be the feminine only, but it's now it's about recognizing that in order to move forward, we have to balance those energies and work together because they are complementary energies. And we need to, we, it's, it's the end of the polarity and go towards unification of this. But the first step of this, the project's mission is to um, approach um, at least 36,000 women in the world and for them to uh, fill out um, a survey questionnaire which has been written by uh, several people um, in collaboration. And the questionnaire basically asked the women that um, what world do they wish to see and what change in the world do they wish to see and what's stopping them realizing this world and what do they need to help them move towards this world that they wish to see. So they're, they're quite open-ended questions rather than just a, a rather than being a closed-ended multiple choice survey. These are open questions and the aim is to have um, connect with organizations on the ground who will approach women on the ground, not local women, women of all um, all status and all walks of life, not just the, not just professional women, um, and also to translate it to women who are even perhaps literate in, in certain regions can can um, uh, with the help of a translator can answer the questions, and then to have a organize regional gatherings in each continent where the results of those surveys will be brought together and there will be an action plan developed from um, that gathering, from the survey answers and from women being physically gathered together and each continent will have an action plan. Then to take this action plan and to deliver it on a world stage at certain um, conferences or certain organizations and to then contact potential philanthropists and, and donors and organizations with resources and say, these are action plans. How can we put these plans into action for women on the ground in their communities who need these resources or these projects? And also that hopefully the project aims to nurture local women's projects, women's circles in the, in the region. So it's not just a case of approaching women and say, please fill out the survey and then that's it but to try to give them a toolkit to, um, to give them advice and, um, and guidance or mentorship, and hopefully to try to find some ambassadors for this program to help women develop women's circles on the ground, then develop their own networks, and to see how they can help each other in their own networks to again empower themselves and really to get women in the conversation and to realize that they can empower themselves, they need to be a part of the conversation, and that uh, we certainly wish to listen to them and put their voice forward to the larger community. So that's the mission plan, and we are currently in talk with certain locations, also in other conferences, to perhaps try to um, create conferences with, collaborate with young people, indigenous women, and to present these um, projects in other conferences, and to spread the word and to really get this out into the mass consciousness. And we'll be looking for perhaps also um, some known people to take this up to um, to support this. So the website will have, in, um, as this interview goes out on your through your channels, the, the survey will be up on the website. So also anyone can approach the survey direct as well without having to be approached by an organization on the ground. So it, it, these are early days, but these, this is the mission of, of the project. It's ambitious, but I, th I think it's uh, needed. I, I think you're right. It sounds a whole lot like crowdsourcing that integrated balance that you were talking about earlier with the, the, the impetus coming from the edge to overwhelm the center. 
Well, that's it. We can't do things ourselves. That's the old model of wanting to uh, run into the world and say, we're going to do it for you. We're going to you know, sort it out. And This is the me, way. That, yeah, this is the way. Listen to us. We know better. Whereas, you know, that... <laughs> That's, for me, a kind of colonial model where we go into someone's lo- local, local context and say, you know, we'll, we'll help you. Where really we want to say, tell us what you're thinking, what you need, and how can you do it, and how can we collaborate with you? Thank you. That, that's exciting to hear about. Kingsley, why women? What special gifts do they bring in creating a fair and sustainable world? Well, um, they bring balance, I would say, but there are certain perceptions and ways of looking at the world that we need to listen to from uh, the women. Now, there are certain values which are connected with feminine values. Now, I don't wish to stereotype, nor do I wish to say that men don't have these values either. But there are certain values which are known to have a feminine energy, such as... Maybe maybe come naturally to women more than men? Yes, yes, I would say that. And there's a, a, the, the nurturance aspect um, and compassion and listen, the dialoguing, listening to all sides. But we've known that there have been examples where a problem has been put forward, for example, this has been noted by um, in uh, leadership literature, that problems have been put forward into corporations and... Um, the perspective which comes from the men is totally different than when given, asked um, the women involved to to look at the the, the issue. It's because of a certain viewpoint which um, I feel has been lacking in in this um, let's say male um, dominated era, and so this this patriarchal era, which which is being too unbalanced and lacking that that tolerance that nurturance that guidance and so what we wish to say is that well the world needs some more advice it needs some more perspectives and it needs to listen to those who perhaps voices have not been recognized or listened to yet so often um the voices which get heard in the world are usually the loudest and most brash or those which are in the positions of authority and percentage-wise, um, men are in the more positions of authority. So, again, part of the model is going to the grassroots model about listening to people on the ground, getting their voices heard, but specifically to listen to women's voices because we feel they've not been heard enough over over present uh, years. And, and especially we need now more than ever in order to, to pull together as a species, as a planetary species, we need such things as um, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, uh, fairness, and, and empathy. And perhaps these qualities have been manifested more by women than men. Well, Kingsley, women may be the shadow of the patriarchal culture of this world. If we add underprivileged, non-Western women. It may even go so far as to be the shadow of the white patriarchal Western culture. If we, if women are included, will this require an ego death for the patriarchal culture? Well, it's a good question, and it, it would certainly, I feel, need a ego recalibration. Whether that would be a death, I can't say. There is, in all, in human life, there is a, a place and a role for the ego, but the ego should be having a lesser role that um, that helps in our survival rather than being the dominant voice. So I wouldn't say we need the death of the ego. I say we need the, the subservience of the ego. And um, we need to we need to reconsider our identity especially now when we are seeing that voices, especially as you mentioned, the underprivileged voices from, um, from non-Western regions, they're, they're making themselves heard as well. Um, in, in their dissatisfaction, we've seen certain uprisings, etc. But we need to move together in, in dialogue and, and that balance. And 
as we, you know, the I, I, I have a sense that this this viewpoint that the Western world is leading the world, it, it's its not true anymore. You know, the developmental wave, the consciousness wave is moving across the planet. And really, if if we think that um, the West is going to lead the way, then really that's our downfall and that that, that will be the Achilles heel and it'll, 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 it'll crash quicker. The developmental wave is spreading across the planet and I think we are going to see greater change coming from those areas which so far have not played dominant roles. Um, it's interesting where some sociological commentators are now saying that, in fact, we live in what they say is no one's world. In mm. fact, it's no one's world because no one's a major player. No one can do it alone. We're therefore in everyone's world is an open playing field and when we have an open playing field or a, a blank slate then I, I feel that the, the opportunity will perhaps um, be more leaning towards those voices yet which haven't been heard because there'll be more energy let's say the developmental wave will be going over to, to, to uplift and and um, to work in those in those places so the project will aim to go into a, um, all the all the major regions, as I said, and have continental gatherings to include um, to women in those areas. So it's it's a major challenge, and the thing is, we we don't know what can or can't be done, which is I think is a good thing because <laughs> if, if if we knew everything, if we had all these plans and all the parameters sorted out, we you know we may we may just have an, an overwhelming kind of sense of awe, like uh, we, we can't do this. Great things are done by not thinking too much about them and not knowing that they can't be done and just really put the energies and the intention and the focus in the right way and we'll find out that really that can move mountains. So the project is in the early days, but I feel everyone that I've spoken to, um, it just straight away the reaction is, um, that's it. You know, that, that's great. Um, what can I do? Even, even um, local friends here I've spoken to and men friends I've spoken to, most people they get it, and and they they you know they want to do something. So I've not heard any neutral reaction to this project or any negative reaction. So I think that's a sign that the time now is ripe to to actually work in this direction. Well, it sounds beautiful, and I was thinking as you were talking that if you had planned everything out, that would be a linear left brain. <laughs> Uh, way mm -hmm. of working so if you just by dialoguing and moving organically and spontaneously that will be wonderful how do you envision that, that would support women and men and children for that matter by doing this way doing it this way and what support and other areas of assistance do you hope will arise out of it and these are, again, great practical questions, and this is what we have been looking at. And we, part of the project is what we call open plan, is that we've, we feel we're going to be pleasantly surprised by what will come out of this. Now, already, we've had one or two contact with organizations who have been very open and, and more than open, enthusiastic and willing to help to um, connect and, and with women's uh, in their local networks on the ground, and to develop women's circles, and so we get a we get a feeling that again, once we put out this energy or put out the call, there will be a response to it which we can't envision, and we f we we hope and we feel that people will step forward, organisers organization will step forward and offer their help and say what can we do and we want to get women together and, and get a dialogue going now one example is that um the um the project director of um this of this uh, women for care and world uh, project got together a a group of women in her local region and talked about this they went to the survey they talked about it and they discussed it and they uh, they had um, hours talking about what they need and what they wish to see. And then, um, then she went back for a second meeting because she got called back. And the, the women's group said, by the way, we want to let you know that we're, we've decided to develop ourselves. We've got our own plan. Is that we each realize that each of us has a dream and something we want to do. But at the moment, we can't fulfill it individually. So 
we've decided that we're going to take one person at a time and all of us help to fulfill this person's dream, do the best we can to help them. And then we'll move to the next person and we'll all help together to help serve their dream. So they've already come up with their own plan, which we didn't envision. So we get a sense that once we can put women together, get them talking together, get them realizing that they can help each other. There is a network there. There are organizations also wanting to, to listen and to help, that this will be a catalyst for something that we perhaps can't envision because it may also come from the women themselves. Of course, a practical question is, if there are certain needs, practical needs or projects, um, we, as, we, as I said, the hope is to develop a, a action plan which will look for trying to connect to philanthropy to fund local projects or microfinance them or help the women to find microfinance for their own projects. So that's a, a pragmatic level. On another level, what we're also hoping for and what we feel is important is that part of the project is really to seed the meme of, mm. uh, of this, to put it into people's consciousness and to get people catalyzed so then we don't know where it will go, but we want to get people talking about it. It's important to put the idea and the meme into the collective consciousness. That is, that is, uh, a, that's another part of the project which is less tangible but just as real and just as important. Well, I would think even more important, actually, because putting it in the consciousness is wow, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I wish you and everyone involved much success and I'll look forward to following it. So could I also say that the part of the plan of the project is we wish um, to gather women's testimonies about what they will wish to what change they will wish to see in the world by asking them to send in a, a very short three, four minute or whatever two minute video clip of them talking about this that we'd like to gather and put together into a montage and use the video footage and use this for spreading the word. So if any any woman listening to this, um, our conversation, if they feel so inclined to sit in front of their computer or in front of their mobile phone or any type of camera and speak for a couple of minutes about the change they wish to see in the world or how that what's stopping them or how they wish to move forward, any of this or anything they wish to say related to this subject, we would be most, most pleased and most willing and open armed if they would then send that video in to our webpage which is Women for Caring World. Women um the number for caring world and we'd love to receive as many as possible so we can represent their voices. Oh, that sounds wonderful. And how healing and empowering that will be for so many women to just do that in and of itself. Kingsley, in your interview with Joanna Harcourt Smith, you spoke about having to learn gardening and how you <laughs> agonized over having to prune your fruit trees. But eventually you discovered they had to be cut back sufficiently to enable more growth to occur. How does this, perhaps as a lesson for all of us today, reflect the lessons available to us all through nature and our home planet Earth? Um, well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, it, it's, it, it sounds uh, somewhat lovely coming from, from, from when you say it and probably when I said it at the time. Um, it was true. I, I do feel we can learn so much from observing the world around us. and. Um, I entered, for example, I entered the garden with zero experience and um, I don't think anyone in my family expected me to be successful with the garden since I'd, you know, I hadn't even pulled a weed before. Um, and so I've learned and I, ha I had no fear in learning, I just jumped into it. And I think that's again important is don't, you know, we don't have to think about what's going to come out of it or try to plan it or fear it, we just have to do it because as you, as you said, pruning back, this is a living universe. Everything is about growth. We can see plants growing through cracks of concrete or you know, in, in urban environments or between walls or under escalators. I see plants, everything, nature grows. The human spirit grows. Everything is life and wishes to grow. All we have to do is allow it and be a part of it, not to stop it or to fear it or, or to you know, agitate about it, um, we need to step into the flow and be a part of it and we'll learn so much more. At the end of the day, all we've got to lose is our self. And is that such a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's not. <laughs> 
Chipper, you have a poem for Kingsley. Kingsley, again, this has been an exhilarating conversation to be part of, and I, I thank you for, for joining us. I was listening to your, your talk on the 2100 conference uh, just recently. I wrote this. Marginal Notes, Unifying Factorials. We've tried shaming and the blaming and that gaming all along. We've had many try to tell us that we shouldn't sing our song, and all the interactions that we share are somehow wrong, that loving freely's not the answer, so let's outlaw all the bongs and penalize life's very fabric, consciousness wraps as it's wrong, to not collaborate with bondings connecting us intensely strong, at least not here now in this moment, rather somewhere out beyond. Namaste. Thank you, Chipper. That was truly wonderful, and you've, you've got the gist spot on. Well read as well. Thank you, Chipper. It's a harmonious synchronization, just like you've said. Give of you, and you receive. <laughs> yes. And I want to thank you, Kingsley. It's been a fabulous conversation, just like the last time. And I've been chuckling behind the scenes of all the synchronicities going on. I'd say we're dancing in harmony. <laughs> Thank you, Susan and Chipper and David. Again, this conversation is, is like a family around the sofa. And, and also, I appreciate your very considerate questions, uh, which, which is what makes a conversation. I just say the world is full of serendipity and, and joy and connectivity. And let's enhance it and, and rather than shy away from it. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Kingsley, would you tell us about your website and uh, any information you'd like to direct people to on, on your website? Thank you, Susan. Yes, I, I, my website is my name, kingsleydennis.com. You can just Google my name, Kingsley Dennis. Uh, luckily, there's not many of us out there. You can find it quite easily. I, I put a lot of material on the website. I, I have many articles free for downloading. I have articles in Spanish and French. And also, I put out a newsletter every month, which I write an article for. And also, I put out uh, news links and, and web links and video links. So um, that my web page is like my where I, where I exist on the web, and you can find out a lot more from me and what I've written about there. And please, I try to provide everything just for free to take so people can inform themselves. 